Special events in the two Virginias. Issues that matter to you. People making a difference. This is In Focus on WVBA with your host, Rick Douglas. Good morning and welcome to In Focus. I'm Rick Douglas and today it's my pleasure to introduce to you Elisa and Dan Clark. They are the proud owners of the Elkhorn Inn and Theater. It's on the historic Cole Heritage Trail in McDowell County and I want to welcome you both. Thank you for coming. I know it's not easy for you guys to break away ever because you're innkeepers and mm -hmm. there's a lot of work that goes into that. You can't leave it just sitting idle, but however you manage to get here, I'm so pleased. Uh, so tell me, first of all, how did you guys become a couple? How did you meet? We met during 9-11. We both were working for FEMA at the time. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, we... So you well, weren't high school sweethearts? No, no. We, met in, we met working for FEMA. And mm -hmm. after the 9-11 operation, Dan got uh, deployed here to West Virginia because of the epic flood that took place in 2002. Mm -hmm. And that's what actually brought us down to McDowell County. And is that where, the, was that the first opportunity you had to see the magnificent building that you have since worked on so hard and transformed into the inn? Yes. He drove past it every day uh, for months and at some point, you know, took me to see it because it was all boarded up. It, it was, uh, it was a mess, but it, it had good bones, as sure. they say. It was a beautiful, very Italianate building with a balcony and archways, and it was romantic, and he, he thought he could save it. Well, as a matter of fact, we have a photo of what it looks like today, and if our director, John, will pull that up, there it is in Landgraf, mm -hmm. right? Um, it is a magnificent building. I've driven by it a few times. I wanted to stop in, and I'm so glad I got a chance to meet you guys because I, I'm going to shadow you now. But uh, we also have another f uh, photo of what it looked like before it became the inn. That's the historic photo that you have on your Facebook page. We actually found that in the mud in a plastic sleeve when Dan was gutting the building. Uh, that was the only really cool thing we found in <laughs> five feet of mud that he took out of that building. But that is the 1929 archival photograph of the building. So, Dan, what madness prompted you to undertake <laughs> this project and transform this enormous brick building into the inn that uh, it is today? There were three things, actually. Uh, one... I kind of enjoyed the building, just seeing it mm -hmm. the first time. I thought I could rebuild it. And the third thing, I believed that me and Elise had to start our own business together and work on something together if we were going to stay as a couple. Mm -hmm. I thought that was very important. Now, do you have any background in carpentry and plumbing <laughs> and all that stuff? Yes, but my, my actual profession was an aircraft mechanic. Okay. And you learn a little bit of everything doing that. <laughs> so you end up doing a lot of different things. But he had restored a 1700s church in Virginia. Sure. So he knew what he was doing. Of course. He sort of knew what we were getting into when the, When you looked when at the building, when you start a project like that, you have to realize, okay, it's going to be a huge project, but how do you handle it? First thing you do is clean out the mess and start over. Well, you said, Elisa, that it's a lot of mud yeah. in there. He took five feet of mud out of the basement with shovels, and I'm four foot ten. And when you're <laughs> eye level, you know, you're looking up at mud, then you re five feet doesn't sound like much until you're, you're eye to eye with it. It, right. was, it was immense. And the funny part is I know nothing about restoration. Okay, I'm an illustrator and a writer by profession. So when... We were in the building, and it, I mean, the, the water line was eye level with me. It was four feet high, and the mud, the mold went up six feet high. And Dan looked around and he said, Well, just gut the building. And I thought, honestly, I thought, Oh, that sounds easy. I had no clue, mm -hmm. not a clue what, what we were getting involved in. When friends heard about what you were doing, did they think you were nuts? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. They all thought we were crazy. People, people would park the car across from the building and laugh at us while Dan was gutting the building. Thinking that it would be an impossible task Absolutely. for local folks, let alone transplants, right? Yeah. Those crazy folks from away? From, they quote, New York, because <laughs> I'm from New York, and you can hear it in my voice. Mm -hmm. So it was those crazy people from New York. He's actually originally from Chicago, right. but he lived in Virginia for a long time. The, the biggest problem uh, was getting good help, and, and that's a, a problem that continues on in any, any time you're in an area. The workforce... Uh, is a lot smaller than people think. Mm -hmm. And the skill level, uh, if you have the skills to do a lot of that work, you're going to go somewhere else where you can sell that skill. Right, because there's so not a lot of call for that kind of work in McDowell yeah. County, yeah. right? That's right. Yeah. So well, that's he had to teach himself some things like to do plaster work. <laughs> Everybody who does plaster work is either retired or dead. <laughs> As we discovered. Okay. So he, he had to, to do the plaster work on the ceilings. He had to teach himself, you know, crafts that are essentially archaic, you know, skills like stonemasonry, you know. But uh, I remember the plastering of the ceilings, that was, it takes real creativity mm -hmm. uh, and engineering creativity to be able to do that kind of a restoration. Did you ever? have conversations where you thought maybe we've bitten off more than we can chew? More uh, than once. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. All the time. Oh, yeah. But you believed in this. Yeah, yeah. I believed it. Uh, it, was, it was a good project. When, you, when we started it, we ended up uh, working six months to get the building open. And we had the time frame to do that with. It was uh, very hard at first. We actually opened the doors six months after he started working on the building. That's awfully ambitious. That's no, it was it was insane, but we had to get the doors open by May because we took possession of the building in December, because we had given up our jobs to do this, and mm -hmm. the tourism season starts in May. Right. And we had people knocking on the door before the marble was even lay, laid and saying, please let us stay. So we, we actually opened the 15th of May and then kept working on the rest of the building because originally we opened with like, what, eight guest rooms yeah, really. on the second floor. And then we opened the dining room and then we opened the gift shop and then we opened the guest rooms on the third floor, you know, but we opened originally after six months. Well, I'm still a little bit intrigued about what it is of, that you saw in a, an inn that's kind of off the beaten track in McDowell County. Because as we all know, especially you now, um, it's not exactly a tourist mecca in West Virginia. It or it hadn't been. Actually, it, it is. is. It is now. It, but it, is, it is even then. What we were finding was a lot of people were coming down. They were not staying. They weren't in, staying in McDowell. In because there was no place for them to stay. stay. That was one of the problems. Uh, the three major attractions for, for McDowell County is the ATV, right. the trout fishing, mm -hmm. and the, floor, uh, the rail fanning. Now, people don't realize that it is one of the best trout streams in the eastern United States, and it is not stocked. It's wild. It's a wild It's trout actually stream. been called the best wild trout stream in America by Trout Unlimited people. I had no idea. It's outrageous. So you have people coming to you just for the trout fishing? Yes. We yeah. had an Orvis guide. He was written up by a journalist that was at the inn when he came. He was an Orvis guide from Virginia. And he was blown away. He said, it, I mean, he's fished everywhere, including Patagonia. And he said it was the best fishing he'd ever had. He caught like 40 fish. Uh, we've had guests, don't laugh, catch 150. On a weekend. On a weekend, 60, 30, 4 before breakfast, 45 before lunch. Now, granted, a lot of these, these people, they're trout unlimited. They're really, really good. But even we catch fish in that creek. I mean, <laughs> and you're talking 24 to 32 inch trout. These are big, whopping <laughs> trout. 
It's he and he was explaining how he knew they were wild trout because of the colors in their cheeks. Uh -huh. Apparent, yeah. And he was that it was very definitely a wild trout stream, and that's what made it so fabulous, and so on and so forth. So yeah, we get we get guests from all around the country, and it's catch and release with these people. Although you know, we, right. and we encourage catch and release because frankly, if these guys catch a hundred fish before breakfast, they're going to fish out the creek. Right. So what they do, they, these are all catch and release. They catch them, they take a picture sometimes, and then they. But wild back. trout is occasionally on the menu yeah. at uh, Elkhorn Inn, right? Yeah. No. Well, no. Uh, we have trout on the menu, but not not from Elkhorn Creek. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about what's on the menu okay. at Elkhorn Inn when we come back, so stay tuned. Welcome back to In Focus. My guests this morning are Elisa and Dan Clark. They're the owners and operators of the Elkhorn Inn in Landgraf. And, um, you know, I have to say it reminds me of the old TV show, uh, Newhart, where Bob Newhart and his wife are running, the, the Loudons are running the inn in Vermont. And, of course, uh, West Virginia is not at all like Vermont. And um, one of the specialties that we discussed on the phone is that right now we're in what you could call ramp season. And uh, I understand that ramp is, or the ramps are used quite liberally in the menu that you serve at the inn. And Dan, you're the chef. Yeah, I'm the chef. You're the chef. Yeah, and I came up with the green eggs and ham idea because <laughs> Dr. Zeus is the comment on it. Sure. And it was fun. And it was by making a pesto on it, you can add it to scrambled eggs, make a nice green eggs, Put a little ham with it. It always gets a laugh. It always gets. And people, people enjoy it. It's and also good. because we make the pesto, we can have things with like ramps all year, right. not just for that glorious two-week period in April when everybody has sautéed ramps. Right. And in fact, you did something very nice. You brought in some real, honest to goodness, West Virginia ramps. Because we went and dug them. Because you dug them. About we have some pictures ago. that I'd like to show our audience. Uh, of Dan, well, first of all, I want to mention this because I saw this on your Facebook page. It looks like Wiener Schnitzel to me. Maybe I'm wrong there, Dan, but um, it looks like sauteed veal with yeah. capers and so on. I, th I can't really tell from here, but I, what may be the chicken piccata? Oh, that's yeah, what I'm yeah, thinking, yeah. chicken piccata, okay. Um, and then we have uh, another photo of Dan in the forest. <laughs> looking for ramps mm -hmm. and how do you find them i mean where you do you go around. for them you well oh you can't tell us where you find them because that's <laughs> a secret right no, no you got it's, it's got to be on a, it's got to be on a fairly slope uh hard slope with a southern exposure and a lot of uh mulch and that's where you're going to find them at okay. uh, we have it took us 13 of years. Showing off what you found in the forest. Yay, mm -hmm. ramps. <laughs> Well, it's a big deal now. You know, I guess years ago, uh, people sort of made fun of them as hillbilly food. Uh -huh. and, but then the hot chefs, you know, Mario Batali and, and, uh, and the others, they got a hold of ramps. And now you see them online for like $30 for 10 ramps by FedEx. Wow. Well, it took us 13 years to figure out where they were growing. <laughs> and now we found Ramp Mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, but you do need a four-wheel, you know, you need a four-wheeler, uh, to get out there, and we were in mud up to Dan's waist. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, we have a photo. Well, there are the ramps that are now being what washed. Yeah, yeah those are do, in the sink. Can after you we store got them? Home. Do you should wash them before you store them, or do you store them? Yeah. You wash fresh? them before you. Well, wash you them wash them, them and then we made pesto and we made pickled ramps. Okay. Well, the next photo we have is of the pickled. Yeah, yeah those ramps. are the pickled. And you brought some mm -hmm. with you. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to sample them for the first time. Okay. This is historic. These are the pickled ones. Mmm. They have a kind of um, 
garlicky yeah. flavor. Kind of. Don't they? <laughs> Pickled garlic. It's really yeah. good. I can see why people are so wild about ramps. Yeah. That's wow. a Jap that's an interesting Japanese recipe.